Hello Year 8, Mr Langer here, I hope you're safe and well. Welcome to week 5, what are the consequences of climate change for the UK and Antarctica? So you'll need to know for this week, um, you need to know some of the impacts of climate change on the UK and also some of the impacts on Antarctica. So we'll go through those. Um, but we also at this stage really need to be elaborating on how the interruption of the natural processes, what's normally happening, can lead to negative or maybe even some positive consequences. So these are some of the issues associated with climate change. So if I'm just going to, oh, sorry, I'm just going to start up here on um, the top one here and um, talk about the snowpack. Now these ones, um, snowpacks actually um, provide loads and loads of fresh water for loads and loads of people around the world. Not so much in the UK, but certainly in places like Bangladesh and India, where snow from the Himalayas um, actually melts uh, and then provides water for rivers like the Gantries and the Brahmaputra. Um, these uh, yeah, are really, really vital for people uh, to live and uh, for people to be able to have access to clean safe drinking water so plainly if the, the temperature increases and the snow packs reduce then so will the access to drinking water and it's the same with um, glacial melt um, this second one here that's not a very accurate uh, line sorry about that but um, the glaciers do exactly the same job as the snowpacks in terms of providing many, many people access to clean, safe drinking water. Forest fires. Now we know from previous weeks that forest fires start when we've had a lot of very hot and dry weather and the, the wood really, really dries out. It almost uh, becomes a little bit like kindling and kindling is a sort of very dry wood that you use to start a fire. So um, <coughs> the um, the risk of forest fires really rapidly increases, doesn't it, with the um, uh, the increase in global temperatures. And we saw that in Australia earlier this year. Extreme weather. Now, this is something um, that is, is potentially going to affect the UK in quite a significant way, because as I'm going to demonstrate in a minute, the UK tends to have um, some fairly... Um, fairly sort of mundane weather if you like uh, it can be a little bit unpredictable but we don't get extremes of wind rain heat um, we, we tend to have quite a temperate climate temperate means uh, not extreme um, but that could potentially change along with changes to the climatic system caused by global warming um, and increase in average global temperatures agriculture um, obviously uh, depends a lot on water, doesn't it? We need uh, to water our crops, and um, the, uh, the with the increase in um, temperatures, we're going to have to do that more. Uh, and there's also potentially changes to the growing season. Lower river levels reduce water supply, um, and um, and I live uh, well. We all live in or close to Maidenhead, and um, many many people are out on the um, the River Thames at the moment. So um, yeah smaller river flow um, that's going to interrupt a lot of the natural processes that you can see down here uh, and uh, indeed moving on from that one that's the habitat uh, warmer temperatures um, tend not to go well with the habitat for species like trout things like that they like colder water and again um, I'm going to talk about this at the end of this powerpoint but this trout has spent millions of years um, evolving to certain conditions so if we change what those conditions are very quickly then it's not going to be able to adapt fast enough lower levels of groundwater now groundwater the best way to think about this is if you dig a hole uh, if you've been to the beach recently and you dig a hole then that that hole starts filling up with water eventually doesn't it and what you've done there is you've reached this point here you've reached the water table um, now in instances where we see lots and lots of drought and lots and lots of heat you tend to find that the water table lowers and that means that it's more difficult to access water which is sitting in the ground and that's not good for anyone because obviously we know how water uh, is vital for all of us hydroelectric power now hydroelectric power is something which is uh, or you have a dam uh, water runs through the dam here 
Um, and um, when that movement of water goes through the dam, you have uh, a turbine being pushed and spun, and that's how electricity is created. Now, plainly, if the water level is reduced, there is less potential energy to convert into electricity. So again, lots and lots of problems associated with this changing climate. And I said to you a moment ago that we have a temperate climate in uh, in the UK. So I said that we had a temperate climate. We don't really have extremes. Now you can see the red line here. This indicates, um, as everyone who knows about climate graphs will be able to tell us, this indicates um, that we have a um, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Um, so um, this is where we are around about now, June, July, August. Um, and this is where our temperatures are highest. But interestingly, the blue bars demonstrate the rainfall. And you can see that we get rainfall right the way throughout the year. It's not like the, um, the savannah where we get no rainfall for nine months of the year and then loads of rainfall in three months of the year. We are experiencing what we call reliable rainfall. It rains every single month. And that's really useful actually. That's great for us because it means that we have a constant source of fresh water. Um, however, I said to you a few minutes ago that with changes in climate, with more extremes in temperature, uh, this is sort of thing that might happen. Um, when you have periods of very, very dry, warm weather, followed by lots and lots of rain, that's a real problem. It's a real problem for a couple of different reasons. Um, the, the, the most clear and obvious one is that the ground, the soil gets very, very hard. It gets baked. What we call the soil is baked when it gets really, really hard and it gets cracked because of the, uh, the heat. Now, those cracks are simply caused by water being evaporated from the soil. Um, but when that happens and when it's left, it's very dry. It's almost like concrete, isn't it? Um, really, really firm. And um, actually, when the when it rains really, really heavily, like you can see it has done in these pictures, um, the soil is actually unable. It's too hard to get um, or too hard for the water to infiltrate into it and therefore the water runs over the ground rather than through the ground which is a very slow process it runs over the ground and it gets into the rivers very very quickly and whenever water gets into rivers quickly that's when you have a significant risk of flooding water that gets into rivers quickly is likely to overwhelm the river quickly and what's happened here is just that you've got some steep sided um, valley uh, sides here. You've got loads and loads of rain and all of that water. There, there is actually a river here. There's a norm normally a river, um, but all of this water has come in and it's overwhelmed this river. And you can see down here uh, that all of these houses and then you've got loads of cars and things like that that have been moved by the force of the water. This is a big flood. Now, this is, these photographs were taken in the village of Boscastle, which is a town or sorry, a village in Cornwall. So, um, yeah, I, it, it looks like uh, almost like a disaster scene from something out of a, you know, a you know, tsunami movie or something like that. But it's not. This has happened in our own country. Um, and so um, we find that, yeah, um, very hot, dry conditions like we've got at the moment can lead to flooding. The other thing uh, to remember is that when you get very, very warm uh, conditions, you'll know from last year's study, uh, of weather and climate that very very warm conditions can often lead afterwards to thunderstorms and I'm recording this on a Thursday now this is a Thursday at the end of the heat wave and actually by um, the, the next day we might be experiencing some thunderstorms the reason for that of course is that when you have lots of heat you have lots of evaporation and when you have lots of evaporation you have lots of condensation therefore you have big clouds um, therefore you have the potential for a lot of rain. So essentially what I've just said there, these are um, some examples of flooding and uh, scientists think that the UK will start to experience hotter, drier summers with lots of drought, but then also warmer, excuse me, wetter winters. A more extreme climate. 
So we've got some impacts here. So water availability, us not having the amount that we need. Big problem, particularly as our population is growing. Reservoirs will be impacted. Reservoirs are stores of water and they are going to be uh, depleted. Demand for water is likely to increase. As I said, uh, population is increasing. We also use water for the lots of supply of electricity and, uh, and uh, even products, jeans, a steak, um, anything, anything. You know, the manufacturer of footballs, they all require water uh, for that energy and for, uh, for that manufacture process to, to be allowed to happen. Now, um, the impacts on the water infrastructure, infrastructure normally when we're saying it, it means sort of uh, roads and railways and airports, but it can of course also mean um, the pipes that carry water. Uh, it can also mean our electricity infrastructure. Now, um, the big problem with a, a changing and more extreme climate is that heat and cool um, conditions can force soil to move. It can um, create soil movement, it can force um, the soil to crack and um, as the soil moves so do the pipes and of course when you get this big movement they're not really designed to move pipes so um, yeah, you, you can get um, some, some cracking in them. Um, assets, when it says assets here what we're talking about is people's homes, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about roads um, and anything which is close to um, either rivers or the coastline is therefore at risk due to coastal erosion, due to flooding, uh, any, any of that sort of thing. And then finally, lower river levels mean wastewater will be less diluted uh, and need additional treatment. So any, any nasty stuff that does find its way into our rivers is going to be more concentrated. It's a little bit like having a glass of orange squash. If you put a little bit of orange squash in, it's not very concentrated, it's not very, uh, yes, it's weak. Um, but if you pour loads, or if you, if you take away a lot of the water and then pour the same, even the small amount, it's going to be more uh, more, um, oh, it's going to be stronger, isn't it? And that's exactly the same issue in our um, our rivers. And I know that a lot of you like to go to the River Thames, and uh, you know maybe sort of do some paddle boarding on it and, and things like that. Well, um, yeah, of course we need to consider that if the river level is lower, any any pollution or any sewage or any rubbish in there is going to have a greater impact. Now, this is a fantastic resource. You don't have to watch it, um, but I'd recommend that you do if you have time. It's a David Attenborough documentary. It's about an hour long. It's a really, really um, fantastic uh, documentary all about how climate change is likely to affect the UK and both now and in the future. So that's the link to it there. Um, now, finally, uh, we did need to talk about Antarctica um, and you can see in this heat map on the right hand side that it tends to be the areas at higher latitude which are experiencing the most significant um, impacts or most significant um, climatic changes in uh, the world. So very high latitudes, North Pole, South Pole, these are the areas that are hotting up the most. And that's a bit of a problem, um, and I'm going to demonstrate that now. This is a picture of uh, Antarctica. Now, um, it's not too difficult to research this. It's known as Antarctica greening. So um, Antarctica, South Pole, uh, obviously a, a great big landmass with lots of ice on it. Um, but for the first time, organisations like NASA are, are recognising that whereas it used to be all white because it was covered with ice and snow, it's now beginning to look a little bit green. Um, and I said to you right at the start of this session, is there any kind of significant benefits to, to global warming, climate change? Well, potentially there's a benefit because if we can utilise this uh, land mass of Antarctica to perhaps grow crops, we can feed the uh, ever increasing population. However, it's really, really important to recognise that all of the, the plants and the animals, uh, well, aren't really many plants, but certainly the animals that live in Antarctica have become adapted to very, very specific conditions. And these conditions, like I say, are changing. Let's have a look at that now. So um, these are the penguins that you saw 
in the previous slide. And um, first of all, let's let's look at the feet. Now the feet are designed to walk on ice. And plainly, you saw in the last slide that um, ice is, is, is d diminishing and they're now gonna have to walk on grass. They're really not designed to do that. And that's going to be really, really uh, problematic for them. Um, the flippers, uh, they are designed f really for um, swimming uh, around the water. Now again, um, if a water temperature increases, uh, they can obviously still swim, but this body shape here, um, it, it's, they are packed full of fat and blubber. Um, and the reason for that is the very, very cold conditions. Now they are gonna overheat on both the land and the water if the temperature rises. Um, now feathers, they've got um, waterproof um, outer feathers. Now again, that is designed for them to live in uh, very, very cold, wet conditions. And again, it didn't look like it was particularly cold and wet in that previous picture, did it? So again, they're gonna really struggle. Um, and then the empire um, penguin chick down here, you can see just how fluffy it looks. And again, that fluff is all designed to uh, help it survive in some very, very specific conditions. And this is all of the point. These animals are highly adapted to very, very specific conditions. They can only really do one thing, and that is survive in the very, very coldish, har coldest, harshest climates. And if that cold, harsh climate changes rapidly, they are not going to be adapted to that. Um, and this is just one example. There's dozens of, uh, sort of plant um, and animal species which are going to be susceptible to um, these, these big changes. And um, the whole ecosystem in the, the Antarctic and the Arctic is likely to, to change and potentially even collapse if even one or two species can't adapt quickly enough. So we've talked about some impacts on the UK and we've talked about some impacts on Antarctica. And whilst doing that, we have done this. So I have been elaborating on the points as we've been talking through them. So hopefully that gives you an, uh, an indication of what an elaboration, what you need to be doing in order to elaborate on these natural processes. I hope you found the PowerPoint helpful. Any questions, please do give me a shout. Thanks very much.